So welcome everybody, Hosh Galdiniz. Thank you for joining us here today. We're here to talk about the twin elections in Turkey that will take place this coming Sunday. It goes without saying that these elections are the most consequential in Turkey's modern history. Erdogan and the AKP have been in power for 20 years now and face the prospect of losing that power for the first time. Much has changed in Turkey in these past two decades, and when Erdogan took power, Turkey's population was 65.99 million people, just to give you some perspective. Today, it's 85.279 million. In other words, 20 million or so Turks have known nothing other than his rule. We have a brilliant uh, lineup of speakers with us today to discuss the ramifications of these elections. Dr. Gönül Toll is the founding director of the Middle East Institute's Turkey program and the author of Erdogan's War, a strong man's struggle at home and in Syria. If you haven't already bought it, please do. It's an excellent book. Timothy Ash is an emerging market strategist based in London who closely follows Turkey, dare I say, with his heart as much as with his mind. He's also very passionate about Ukraine. So if you want to know more about Ukraine, follow him on Twitter. Mark Pierini is a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe and a former EU ambassador to Turkey, who also served as ambassador to Syria and other places in the Middle East. And I'm very happy to say that he's far more talkative now that he's no longer an ambassador. I used to be reporting from Ankara when he was the ambassador there and he wasn't quite as chatty. And last but not least, my colleague Diego Kupolo, who's the, uh, the co-founder of Turkey Recap, with uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a fantastic resource on Turkish news that digs really deep and is a must read if you want granular and a witty reporting on what's happening on the ground there. So Gönül, I'm going to start with you. And rather than have you run through the, you know, uh, why these elections matter and all that, because I think with just days to go, pretty much everyone who's here following this webinar knows uh, of why they matter. So Gönül, just looking ahead, um, particularly in domestic terms, what will Turkey look like if Erdogan were to remain in power? And what kind of Turkey would we be moving towards in the event of an opposition win? Is there any chance that Erdogan might reverse course, especially given that we're going to be having you know, mun municipal elections in a year? So he's going to have to need to win those as well. And I bet he's got his eye on Istanbul. Or will things just get darker? And can Kulic Tarolo, if he wins, hold his co coalition together because it's quite messy? Or will we revert to the dysfunction of the 1990s, creating space for the army, for example, to make some kind of a comeback? Well, thank you so much, Amberin, for um, putting this together and inviting me. It's, it's a great pleasure. Um, Talking about different scenarios, I mean, what happens if Erdogan wins the upcoming vote? And it's uh, it's likely, you know, because it's going to be a very tight race. Um, I think if Erdogan wins another term, Turkey will degenerate further um, into authoritarianism, where this time elections will not matter. To me, the most striking thing watching Turkey's, uh, Turkey's elections and having been on, on the ground recently, that there's just still so much hope, especially among the opposition supporters, that change is possible via elections. And, and, and you, you, you must find this really um, incredible because we're talking about a country that, that has degenerated into autocracy, right? And talking about an autocrat who manipulated elections before or did not accept election results. And yet still, I think the majority of people living in Turkey still have faith in that electoral process that, that change is possible. They just have to cast their votes. Sure, there are a lot of, there's a lot of anxiety around election security, but still, uh, uh, the, the Turkish people love elections, and and despite despite the risks and anxiety, they still have have, have faith in them. And I think that's really important 
uh, especially if you want to, if the new government wants to rebuild the country's democracy, right? So that's why I think it's it's quite important to see this much mobilization, this much energy and enthusiasm. And as you know, the uh, turnout in Turkey has historically been very high. Um, but if Erdogan wins another term, and when I say that Turkey will degenerate further into, into authoritarianism where elections will not matter, I think the Turkish voters, particularly um, um, opposition supporters, they will lose that faith in in the electoral process because all the polls, uh, majority of them at least, they put Kılıçdaroğlu in the lead. And again, there is this optimism that this time the opposition can beat Erdogan at the ballot box. So if that does not happen, and if people feel like um, the elections have been rigged, I think that's really going to deal a huge blow to people's faith in, in democratic, in, in electoral process. And I, I think Erdogan will also double down on the repression if he wins another term, because he will be facing a more unstable country. Because remember, um, autocrats, they don't need majorities to, to stay in power. They need a divided opposition. And right now, uh, an overwhelming majority of the people in Turkey are opposed to Erdogan. 60% of them want him gone. That means if Erdogan manages to win elections via either perfectly free elections or some uh, other means, uh, that will he will be facing a more unstable country where the majority of the people do not want him to be running the country. And he will be facing an even um, worse uh, economic uh, uh, crisis. Uh, there are just so many problems with the country's institutions. So when autocrats face domestic um, instability, they usually double, uh, double down on repression. Uh, so, so I don't see, uh, and especially in the post-earthquake environment where there are a lot of problems to be fixed. So I think that's the scenario that I foresee in case of an Erdogan win. If the opposition wins, as they say before uh, the elections in Brazil, right? Lula is not going to be the door to heaven. He's going to be the door out of hell. And, and, and that saying has become popular in the Turkish case. So Kılıçdaroğlu will be um, taking over a huge mess. Uh, an economic crisis, uh, horrible uh, prob institutional problems, and he has pledged to rebuild the country's institutions, uh, switch back to the parliamentary system, resolve the country's Kurdish problems. So that's a huge, long, uh, a huge list of long list of problems, which requires um, a lot of uh, uh, political capital. So the question is, thus, will he have that capital? Well. The presidential system established by Erdogan, the executive presidency, affords him that much power. So I think that's one of the reasons why Turkey will not be able to switch back to the parliamentary system shortly after, after the elections, because the, the new president is going to need those powers. Uh, but can he fix the country's pressing problems? Uh, well, I think he put together a great uh, team of experts on economy. Uh, and yet it's still, it's, it's, it's a challenging task. Um, regarding rebuilding the country's institutions, basically building, rebuilding the country from scratch, it's going to be difficult and he's going to need his allies on his side. So the question you asked, you posed is, is a great one. Can he keep that wide, um, diverse coalition together? And I think he will have to. And he, and here is why, because Erdogan is going to be around. Even if he loses the elections, uh, we're not going to see a Bolsonaro scenario where Erdogan flees the country because he still has a strong following. So he's going to be around. And I think the wise thing to do for Erdogan is to stick around and wait for the opposition to fail, which is not a distant uh, possibility. So that I think gives the opposition a strong enough motivation to stick together, even if if Erdogan loses the elections, right? So that's why I think I'm I'm hopeful that they will uh, stay together and they will uh, probably again going back to one of the other questions whether the new government will be um, taking steps shortly after. Uh, resolving the Kurdish question, they will have to because they're going to need the Kurds on their side as well to to um, uh, realize all the pledges that they've made on the campaign trail. And I'll stop there. 
So thank you, Gunul. Um, I'm going to turn to Tim now because one of the main reasons that uh, Erdogan is in such deep trouble today is really because of the economy, the fact that, you know, prices have gone through the roof, people can't even buy onions anymore. Um, so Tim, can you just give us a sort of overview of where the Turkish economy stands today? And again, uh, I'll put it to you, what will the Turkish economy look like if Erdogan remains in power? And what will it look like if the opposition wins? Well, it's been a continuation of, <coughs> of Erdogan's policies over the last decade in the run up to election. It's kind of muddling through, trying to, to, to keep a very difficult uh, gross financing, gross external financing picture together. So that's basically the, the, the basic fact that Turkey has a, a lot of short term debt and it runs a current account deficit, right? So 180 billion short term debt, 50 billion current account deficit, $230 billion demand for dollars. We only have about 100 billion of, of reserves, actually, a lot less. Than of that is usable reserves, net reserves, massively negative, maybe 60 billion. So it's it's kind of you know borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to kind of anchor the currency through elections uh, because basically Erdogan doesn't want to do what we all know he has to do if he wants to fight inflation, which is raise interest rates. He has a kind of perverse, well not perverse, he has his faith-based uh, obsession uh, with not. Uh, or not using interest rates in a normal demand management, right? So, so they've kind of borrowed money, you know, from the Gulf, from Russia, to kind of plug the hole, to plug this big external financing gap, to kind of stabilize the currency through elections. But they've been using a lot of reserves in the last few weeks, right? And <clears throat> if Erdogan wins, uh, I, the, the, the overwhelming consensus, right, is that the lira basically is now overvalued. Uh, whoever wins, it's got to weaken. Uh, in an Erdogan victory, uh, you know, again, it, it's not rocket science in terms of economics. I mean, if you're faced with a, a big gross external financing requirement gap, you either raise rates to slow domestic demand down, you let the currency adjust uh, to basically make the currency cheaper and, and, and uh, reduce imports and increase exports again to close the current account. You make, you make it difficult to, uh, to buy dollars. So basically capital controls, they've done a lot of the soft kind of capital controls. You can call a friend basically to, to help you either in terms of confidence or FX liquidity. It can be IMF, for example, or it can be the Gulf guys or, or Russia uh, post-election. Um, he doesn't want to raise interest rates. That's clear. You probably do more capital controls, but you know, basically it, it doesn't help the performance of the economy. It's, uh, it, it drives resource misallocation. So that's not very positive. He can let the currency go, right? He can let the currency weaken to a more competitive level, but then that uh, just boosts inflation again. It creates a devaluation inflation spiral. That that's what we've been in, I guess, for the last almost decade. Uh, and he doesn't really want to go to the IMF. Uh, and as I said, he doesn't want to raise interest rates. So he could potentially, I guess, hope that the Gulf guys would provide some dollar financing. Um, they have through into the election. I mean, clearly they want Erdogan to win. He's a counterbalance to the West. They, they like Erdogan in power there. Um, uh, Russia's also provide financing. Uh, but on, on Putin in particular, Putin, I don't think, he needs his dollar reserves himself now. He's obviously in a, in a battle in Ukraine, war in Ukraine. Uh, he's, he's lost a lot of his reserves, reserves that have been frozen. The conflict may have gone for a long time. And Putin probably will want to keep Erdogan weak. So he won't want to give him a get out of jail with a big dollar financing package for, for Erdogan. The Gulf guys are interesting also because, uh, as I said, they have provided some limited dollar financing, a five billion uh, deposit, I think, from the, the Saudis. And we've seen this 15 billion Qatari money. Um, actually, the, the Saudis and the UAE are interesting because the big change that we've seen in their support for um, sort of their bilateral partners or allies, you think of Egypt, Pakistan, is they give money but there's conditions attached and the conditions attached is orthodox policy, right? Uh, they're, they're interested to invest in places like Egypt, but they say, hey, you know, we, we want the currency at the right level. <laughs> we want to trust that you have the right macro policies in place. We're not going to just throw money away uh, investing in th these kind of countries. So Pakistan, for example, they've demanded an IMF program as a condition. So if Erdogan wins, I don't think people will be writing checks for him. And if they do, like the Saudis or the UAE guys, 
that the, they, they will demand some kind of orthodoxy. And whether Erdogan can do that is, is open to question. He may just go back to letting the currency just use capital controls, which means a weaker currency, more inflation, uh, a, a, an economy that's not really performing very well, ultimately. It's is always on the brink of another balance of payments crisis and actually another systemic crisis. I mean, the question we ask ourselves under Erdogan presidency with unorthodox policy is, is there going to be a systemic crisis? Is there going to be a run on, on banks, on bank deposits, when people realize that net international reserves of the central bank are negative, basically central banks bankrupt, in effect, you could argue, right? Now, so that's Erdogan under the opposition. You know, I guess, uh, you know, they have a very, very competent economics team that we know very well. Actually, the, the least well known is, is uh, probably Bill Yilmaz, the E party guy who is supposed to be the economics anchor person, but has a good reputation, obviously, from his, from his uh, stay in the US. The other guys we know very well, Babajan, uh, Chinachi, former Undersecretary of the Treasury, uh, Kerry Rota. I mean, these guys, I mean, particularly look at Babajan Chinachi. I mean, they delivered difficult adjustment uh, when they took office for the first time back in 2002, right? Okay, they were on an IMF program, Kemal Dervish. They kept it kind of on autopilot, but they did deliver a lot in terms of reform. So the market trusts them. They will raise rates. They will let the currency go to a, a, a market clearing level. Uh, they'll do a lot of the adjustment early. And I think, I don't think Turkey's problems are massive from an economics perspective, frankly. I mean, they're a bit of orthodoxy and a bit of credibility in terms of policymakers can kind of resolve. They'll, they'll clear out the central bank, they'll, inter, they'll, they'll have a decent central bank governor, independence of the central bank, they'll actually clear out the state bureaucracy in terms of, uh, in the economics portfolios. And I think investors will buy into that, right? I think there's a, we all know that, you know, a decade ago, Turkey had $130 billion of uh, uh, institutional money invested in the, the local debt and equity market. That's down to like 20 odd billion now. That money will come back, right? With orthodox policy. Um, you'll see FDI pick up, you'll see uh, other capital in inflows, which is basically offshore borrowing increase as well. Um, so I think that's a pretty good scenario. What worries me about the opposition is not, is not really the economics portfolio. I think they can figure out the solutions. Uh, it's really six party coalition. Can it stay together? Uh, you know, I mean, no doubt other people are going to talk about this, you know, the Kurdish issue, um, quite a diverse coalition. So I don't think it's going to be economics that breaks the opposition coalition if it takes office. It'll be other stuff. And that could that could then impinge on on the economic adjustment. So how about that for a starter? That was pretty good for a starter. Thank you so much, Tim. And so, dear Mr. Ambassador, there's a lot to unpack on foreign policy. Turkey is again front and center of uh, foreign policy debates because of the war in Ukraine. So what does an Erdogan victory look like for Turkey's relations with the European Union, with the United States, and how does that play out in the Middle East? Uh, would a Kulichtarulu win be the start of a new era? Can we actually turn back the clock to the days when Turkey could be unequivocally called a NATO ally, although a difficult and prickly one? Or, or actually, are the global geopolitical shifts in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, of the US invasion of uh, Iraq in 2003, sort of part of the reason that Turkey is more assertive these days, trying to carve out space for itself in this rather turbulent, unpredictable um, environment. In other words, would any other government than Erdogan's have approached things dramatically differently, uh, Mark? Thank you, uh, Marin. Well, I'll start uh, with the uh, sort of slightly different question. What's happening in seven days or in 21 days here in Brussels? And I have the EU headquarters here on my left and NATO headquarters there on my right. Um, well, they're going to look at how different the world is this time. And seen from here, Turkey for the next five years is very different from what it was only five years ago or 10 years ago. For. The military is bigger. Force projection capacities are bigger. Uh, the industry is still running strong and innovative. Um, the country is moving towards self-sufficiency, not tomorrow, but it's increasing. 
And Turkey still has one foot, at least, in NATO. On the negative side, well, uh, Tim has spoken about the economy, rule of law is in shambles. Uh, there is this hostile narrative that we are inheriting about the EU, about the US for the five or 10 years uh, past. And also Turkey is seen here as supporting uh, Russia in many ways. Or if you prefer to put it differently, uh, Russia is seen as having neutralized uh, Turkey in many ways. But the other question is, what is Europe looking like today and in the next five years? Well, Europe has a, a war back on the continent, okay? Uh, the war is waged by Russia, not simply, and that's not simple, against Ukraine, but against the EU and against NATO. Uh, the priorities, therefore, are one, to help Ukraine, and two, to turn the EU economy to a war economy, you know, ammunition and production of missiles and so on and so forth. On the foreign policy side, we've experienced what we know from uh, the Erdogan leadership uh, since uh, 2020. But what you see globally is that irrespective of what has been, been promised to Ukraine, you see the enlargement policy vanishing away slowly, slowly, and you see the European political community coming uh, strongly with a summit in Moldova uh, in the on the 1st of June. Now, Turkey's president, whoever that is, will find this new reality. The economy is surviving on steroids, I would say. Population is unhappy, but the Turkish economy is still vitally linked, at least from the industrial side and the service side, to the EU economy. And therefore, there is potential there. And that potential will be needed. Uh, secondly, the war on the European continent, as I said, is bigger than just Ukraine and is there to last for many years. So it is irrespective of the pride of having a Turkish defense industry booming and so on, there is a, a, an element of judgment, which is simply where is Russia going and therefore where is Turkey going with Russia? And, and, and therefore, if you want the, the picture that we have in front of us right now is that Turkey is, is in a way stuck between its natural economic anchor industrially, service-wise, finance-wise, which is Europe, EU plus UK, and to a smaller extent, the US, and this tragic Russian chessboard uh, where it has locked itself in many ways uh, with all the constraints that uh, Russia can uh, uh, impose on, on, on Turkey. Now, the difference between a candidate and the other. Well, if the incumbent leadership wins, we see that institutions here in Brussels are bracing for more of the same. Uh, as uh, Gunnar explained earlier, uh, autocracies, especially an institutionalized autocracy, especially one that has thrived on, on the hostile narrative, including these past few days uh, against the EU, uh, this type of autocracy doesn't change overnight and there will be a, a need for more of, of the same. Um, if the opposition wins, it's not that it's, we're going to, to go to paradise, obviously, overnight, because the priorities will be inside Turkey, it will be with rule of law, it will be with the economy, but at least we will have a, an opportunity for a real dialogue, which has not taken place with Erdogan in the past few years, um, a real professional dialogue and a peace dialogue. This is part of their common platform, they said that, and also they uh, express a strong will that while keeping relations with Russia, they will reaffirm Turkey's belonging to NATO. That will be a unique opportunity to go one by one through the many subjects, not all easy by far, uh, 
Turkey and NATO is one, Turkey deploying troops in uh, Eastern Europe is one, Turkey and the Russian missile is another one. That's a defense part of it. Uh, Turkey EU is, is, is another one. And then Turkey in Syria, Turkey in the Caucasus, Turkey in Libya, Turkey with Greece and with Cyprus. These are all difficult issues, but at least the hope I perceive here, and I was in meetings with uh, people high up uh, here in the EU institutions earlier today, the hope is that at long last, uh, there'll be an opportunity to rekindle a real dialogue, a serious dialogue, not just uh, a sort of uh, electoral based uh, dialogue. So that's where we are, we are right now. Uh, lots of uncertainties, difficult days before the votes, but um, big expectations here. Well, thank you for that uh, tour d'horizon, uh, Mark. And Diego, you're on the ground in Turkey uh, and you're reporting on all of this, going to different places, attending the rallies, just Diego, tell us a bit about the mood in Turkey overall, because my impression is that you have these distinct bubbles where those who support the opposition sort of are living in the sort of, you know, in 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 hope that could almost be described as a bit excessive, perhaps. And on the other hand, um, you have uh, Erdogan supporters who are maybe a bit less hopeful. I don't know. Can you can you just tell us what it's like? And how is it for you as a reporter? What kind of challenges do you face? Thanks, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, basically, there's hope on both sides. It looks like both sides think they'll win, and that's what the polls show. Uh, on the ground, it's very tense. Uh, yesterday, we had some violence, uh, some rock throwing at Imamalu. Uh, me personally, I went to Erdogan's rally in Riza last week, and I went to the Maltepe Istanbul rally for the opposition on Saturday. So I'm just going to compare what I saw. And at Erdogan's rally, uh, the crowd loves him. He starts the rallies by singing uh, Tatli Ses, Tatli Ses songs. Uh, he tells the crowd that he loves them. Uh, I think this works. There's a direct connection. And then he goes on to talk about the opposition with uh, different words and connections to terrorism in different mixes. And now he's throwing some LGBT stuff in the mix. It seems like he's using a Steve Bannon playbook, which is being used in other countries to polarize voters. And um, yeah, the, the crowd follows Erdogan and cheers and boos. When it's time to boo the opposition, they boo. It's kind of like a comedy. Uh, audience, you know, watching. It's very old politics, basically. It's nothing new. You just follow the leader, you do support what he says, and boo when he says to boo. And uh, that's that. Uh, as far as the Malta rally, that there, there was a lot of hope, a lot of smiles. I felt a little bit uncomfortable with how much hope there was, because we've seen hope before in the opposition with Inja, and he failed miserably, right? I mean, he disappeared on election night. Uh, so I feel a little bit concerned that people will be let down if they have so much hope. But it's 50-50 right now. We don't know who will win. The thing that really stuck out to me, because I went to both rallies as a photographer, so looking at the pictures after, you really see the details in the crowd and editing my photos. I just noticed there was something in common in both rallies, and that's uh, distress desperation. Uh, those are nice words for poverty. I think that there's serious economic impacts on people in Turkey. And I could see it in my photos, just old jackets, uh, worn down shoes, just people did not look comfortable. And the economy is the main uh, topic right now, right? So in that sense, who's going to deliver, you know, who's going to fix the economic situation? That's who's going to win, right? And from my point of view, the opposition's promising while Erdogan is delivering because he has the state institutions uh, at his hands and he can announce gas giveaways, he can increase the wages, uh, he can 
also use uh, Defense Tech, Technofest, the warship in Istanbul, now in Izmir, I think. Uh, he, he can deliver things to people in distress. And then the opposition continues to say, Sana Soz, we promise you, uh, that remains to be seen what that means for many voters. So there's this uh, unlevel playing field playing out very clearly in front of us. As far as uh, where we go from here, I think the gas announcement is big, even if it's not a full gas bill that they're paying. I know someone <clears throat> in a family house who's paying 2000 Turkish liras a month just for utilities. That's without rent. Minimum wage is 8,500. I don't understand how people are surviving, you know, with these gas bills, with these uh, just rents, food prices. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very tense. And I think keep in mind that people are not, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to sum it up. It's just sad. I would say it was, it was sad to look at my photos. Yeah, that's that's all I could say. I'm bringing your mute. I, I can't. Yeah, we can't hear you, Amirin. Okay, so everybody, I, I'm doing this online for the first time, so forgive me. Um, so I was just saying it sounds uh, very dire, and um, thank you for that. I want to turn to you, Gönül, and follow up on what you were saying uh, about Erdogan, if he you know, manages to stay in power. You said, first of all, that he'd have to uh, court the Kurds, and that makes perfect sense given that we have municipal elections coming up uh, in a year. Um, and how far do you think he can go in doing that? Um, because we know that he hasn't been clearly because he thought it wasn't in his his own interests. And perhaps also we speculate that there are other constraining factors, the security establishment, for example, and his nationalist ally, Bahçeli, clearly. Uh, will Do you see Bahçeli remaining his ally going forward after the election? Or do you think that, as some people speculate, he may replace him with Meral Akçana? Would she be up for that? Would the Kurds be willing to trust him? And the second question I wanted to ask you is, you know, Erdogan will be sticking around as you stay. He'll be sort of active, etc. But we also know he's in ill health. And we also see that his son-in-law, his younger son-in-law, who's married to his uh, younger daughter and favorite child, Sumeye, and I'm talking obviously about Selçuk Bayraktar, is clearly being groomed for some kind of role. I just look at his social media feed and it's just crystal clear. Um, can you uh, speak to those points, Gönül? Sure. I, actually, I was talking about how if um, Kılıçdaroğlu wins uh, the upcoming vote that you're going to have to uh, have to work with um, with the Kurdish party, um, because I've seen uh, I've seen uh, commentators say that, you know, this is a really ideologically wide coalition. If Erdogan is not in the picture, then they are going to disintegrate. Uh, and Kılıçdaroğlu hasn't really made a specific um, pledge promise to solve. I mean, they, they reference back to um, parliament being the place to resolve the Kurdish question, but they don't really have a roadmap. So people are skeptical about whether um, whether Kılıçdaroğlu will keep that promise. And my answer to that is that they, they're going to have to stick, stick together because Erdogan will be in the picture, in, even if he loses the election. So, uh, but Erdogan too, I guess, whoever wins the vote, um, well, I think for, from Erdogan's point of view, that's less of a problem. Because and I, I've seen that question in the, the in in the Q and A section from the audience. Um, what will Erdogan do? I mean, will the parliament matter for Erdogan if he wins another term? I don't think it will. He will just rule by decree, meaning that he's not going to have to secure a majority in in the parliament. So that's why I see Erdogan uh, being less inclined to work with the Kurds. And the other problem is. And you pose that question, Amber, and will 
the Kurds uh, trust him. I find that very difficult because I think in 2014, that trust was broken. 2014 was an important year. That was the year of the Kobani protest. That was when even those Kurds who backed Erdogan previously felt that that they were not that he was not gonna um, follow through on the promises that he had made. So there is, uh, and I see an overwhelming majority of Kurds now backing. That's what the polls say, backing the opposition. So that 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 trust is broken. And particularly the pro-Kurdish party, they've, they've made it clear, and Selatin Demirtas has made it clear, they have really backed the country's democratization at critical junctures, and 2015 was one of them, and even more so now. So I doubt that they will back Erdogan, especially an Erdogan who is likely to, um, to double down on repression. I think the bigger question is what will the new government do if, if Kılıç Darold wins? And again, my answer to that, that question is that they are going to somehow work with the HDP because in the parliament, I believe that the opposition will secure a majority in the parliament, but not a big enough majority to be able to change the constitution. So they will not have the 360 seats necessary to change the constitution, which means they will have to work with the HDP, right? And to do that, they have to offer something, that they have to take meaningful steps to address the, the Kurdish question. And what about the succession? Selçuk Bayraktar? Yes, that is, I mean, uh, obviously pure speculation, but he seems like the only person who can actually take over. And he's been very visible, uh, unlike in previous uh, elections, he's been very visible in this election cycle, on the ground, helping the campaign. And an important component leg of Erdogan's campaign has been um, praising uh, what his son-in-law has done in terms of uh, uh, um, defense sector, uh, local defense sector. So he is a likely candidate, I think. Uh, but but when it comes to Erdogan's health, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people thought that that when he fell ill on, on air uh, two weeks ago, that this was going to have a huge impact. But he's back on his feet campaigning. He seems energetic. But his, his health is failing. And in that case, yes, his son-in-law could be uh, the only person that comes to mind. I know people brought up Suleyman Soylu's name, Lucia Akar's name has been circulated. I don't see them as, as um, the most likely ones. No, especially since this is a young a couple. It's not just uh, the son-in-law, it's the daughter-in-law. I mean, the daughter, sorry, as well, who's very active, a very bright young woman. I met her. Um, and together, they really are crowd pleasers, uh, especially in Erdogan's world. So they'll be an interesting uh, pair to watch. Uh, moving on to you, Tim, you said that if the opposition comes to power, you know, they, they will pursue greater orthodoxy, but that also means a lot of pain. And given also that, again, we're having these municipal elections, how likely are they to start delivering that bitter medicine to, you know, sort of jumpstart the economy again, bring back foreign investors, uh, while on the one hand having to weigh the impact on, on their poll numbers? Well, you know, I mean, we've, we've had various interaction. I mean, the investor base, I guess I'm part of that. We've had various interaction with some of these guys, uh, Bill Yilmaz in particular, spoken to investors. Um, I think they've been pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I think they get it. You know, th there's a need for an adjustment. It's going to be painful. Uh, there's obviously a focus on local elections, but they need to get it out of the way early. In, in As soon as they take office, basically, you know, let's say May 29th, second round, a couple of weeks later, new central bank governor in office. I think straight away rates will be up at 35, 40 percent at that point in time. Right. Um, it will. They will have to deflate domestic demand to 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 close that external financing gap. There will be a currency adjustment initially. Um, but I think, as I said, there will be a big inflow of foreign capital um, chasing that reform story. The, the, the positive for Turkey, right, is 
there's a real dearth of positive uh, country stories across emerging markets, right? I mean, if you look across, I mean, Egypt was the darling of the institutional investor base a couple of years ago. Now it's like pretty disastrous. South Africa has massive structural problems, etc. I mean, Russia, Ukraine, that's kind of out as an investment destination. I mean, wherever you look, there are, there are difficult up, bottom up country stories. And I think if, if Turkey can present a, you know, a reform story, you know, clean, cleaning out, you know, institutionally reforming the whole setup. And back to orthodoxy, investors will, will reward that, I think. And um, so they will see a lot of inflows. They will have to rebuild uh, or, or reduce the negative net international reserve position. So that means they'll have to intervene uh, to the, the capital will come in. They'll, they'll intervene buying FX to re replenish FX reserves. That will keep the currency kind of maybe a bit softish. But, but I, I think there's a chance that it can work, you know, there's, there's a real chance that they can get some kind of rebound by the time of the collections. I guess also they'll kitchen sink it, right? I mean, a, a, any negative and any kind of skeletons in the cupboard will be revealed very, very early in the new administrations. I mean, obviously there's a protected FX deposit scheme, it's $100 billion now. If there is this FX adjustment from 20 to 25 to 30, that would be very painful for public finances. Obviously there's question marks about losses in the state-owned banks, some of these uh, public-private partnership things as well, what are the losses there? Um, but but the, these guys are, are you know, they, they've done it before, right? They've been there, they know it, they're pretty, pretty astute. I think they won't mess around in, in my sense, and, and, and the only chance they have in those local elections, uh, whatever, a year or so down the line, is if they've if preemptively uh, uh, made the adjustment very, very early. And I, I think they will have support. I mean, I, I think just going on what the ambassador said, I mean, I think there'll be a great love fest again for Turkey. There'll be a real, I mean, it's interesting. The West has basically not involved itself at all in these elections, right? We've had the Gulf guys, we've had Russia writing big checks to keep Erdogan in power. The West has been silent and provided absolutely no support to the opposition because they don't want to gift an election, uh, well, election gift, to Erdogan to say that you know the West trying to buy the election, so they've stayed on the sidelines. But I think if the opposition win, uh, I'll, there'll, there'll be a real effort to re-engage with Turkey and Tur bring Turkey back in, in from the cold. Interestingly, I think if Erdogan wins, I think there'll be a lot of pressure also on the Erdogan administration to make to make a decision where it stands in terms of the sort of the, the autocracy versus democracy angle, and particularly obviously Sweden's. Sweden's, Sweden's NATO uh, accession bid, I think that'll be the first stop. And I think if Turkey doesn't, under an Erdogan administration, doesn't do the right thing and admit Sweden in, I think there's a significant chance of sanctions on Turkey in an Erdogan administration. Um, and that will add to the, the, the potential pressure on the economics front, right? You've got, you've got a terrible balance of payments position. He's not willing to use interest rates. He's got a massive external financing gap. How is he going to cover it? And you're going to have sanctions from the West, which is going to really make a really challenging story for Erdogan after the election. Well, Mark, the Gulfies are helping Turkey, and that's quite a dramatic U-turn, isn't it? Especially with the UAE, uh, who Turkey accused of helping organize the coup against him, and Saudi Arabia, whose crown prince he more or less accused of murdering uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, in the Istanbul consulate. What is driving the rapprochement? Why have they decided it's it, we 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 can we know why it's in Turkey's interest to have detente with them, but why is it in their interest? Um, and what are they? What is really their end game? And could you also unpack that in the Syrian context, where we see these regimes now reaching out to Assad and welcoming him back? into the Arab League fold. What does that mean for Turkey? Well, essentially what we're seeing is uh, the Gulf countries trying to uh, take into account uh, Turkey's influence uh, and counter Iran's influence. Uh, that's quite clear. The return of Assad into the Arab League, I discussed yesterday, is of course on paper at least conditional but these conditions will uh, vanish away uh, in the sand and uh, uh, Assad will be back. That is not something that will impress uh, Washington or Brussels or Paris or London. 
um, and sanctions against Assad will remain, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that. What's interesting is that if we look back at, at, uh, at Turkey's uh, foreign policy or more generally relationship with, with Europe, that on the foreign policy front, essentially Turkey has been running parallel or running against uh, uh, EU interest in the region. Uh, in Syria, certainly very puzzling on Libya, of course, East Med, of course, uh, 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 Southern Caucasus, but also uh, Turkey in the past few years, uh, at least since 2020, has stopped uh, discussing real issues. Uh, on customs union, nothing. On the refugee program, very little. On counterterrorism, nothing. On rule of law, of course, nothing. And on, on foreign policy dialogue, very little. Uh, you cannot imagine the frustration that there is in the EU institutions about this sort of uh, muted uh, uh, response from uh, uh, the uh, foreign policy and security policy apparatus. In NATO, it's somewhat different because uh, uh, Turkey is sitting there, uh, but in fact, if you look at the measures taken by France or Germany or the UK or smaller countries in uh, uh, reassuring uh, countries from Estonia to Romania and the measures taken by Turkey, well, Turkey is basically staying out. Uh, uh, very little has, has been done. I'm not saying nothing has been done, but very little has, has been done. So. The real point here is that with the re if the opposition comes to power, with the replacement of the higher echelons of the foreign and security policy by uh, new people, you will have new atmospherics, you'll have confidence back. And of course, some of them are real stars. As uh, Tim said, Ali Babajan is a real star in the economic field. Um, so there'll be... Uh, uh, an opportunity, I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but to, to rekindle uh, the dialogue and along the way, as soon as some measures are taken uh, for good uh, on restoring rule of law, you'll have a way to rekindle foreign direct investment. Uh, you know, in Turkey, people feel this very heavy weight about uh, the judiciary being so unfair to so many people. But if you are a European investor, if you are Siemens or Renault or Fiat, and you're running billions of investments in Turkey, one of your fears, one of your fundamental fears is what happens if I have a real litigation with the government uh, and where is the judiciary going to go? So this has led uh, the financial world in Europe uh, to sort of stop and, and watch uh, what's going to happen. So that uh, will be uh, one first step. The other step will be to accompany technically uh, some of the reforms on rule of law or on economy. And uh, that will be uh, the, the key to several other movements on visas, for example, not everything overnight, but gradually. Um, and uh, Refugees will be discussed, uh, will be very difficult because both the incumbent leadership and the opposition want to send back 3.6 million uh, refugees in Syria in the total absence of any internationally agreed uh, uh, framework. Uh, no peace agreement uh, in the making. Um, the likelihood of returnees being harassed and imprisoned uh, not finding anything of their belongings or their land. Um, and well, uh, that is first a problem of uh, domestic politics in Turkey, but uh, it will very quickly become a problem for the EU because of these 9.5 billion euros allocated to Syrian refugees. Well, I mean, clearly, if Turkey, you know, continues to disintegrate, the economy continues to weaken, repression uh, deepens, uh, 
intensifies, I think you'll have you'll be facing a, a refugee crisis for sure of of not nope. Syrians but Turks and Kurds wanting to come to Europe. Um, and I have to say, I feel slightly irritated when I hear uh, Europeans talk about, you know, what kind of Syria will these people return to when they also allow their own citizens to languish in these camps in northeast Syria, the families of ISIS, the children, you know, have zero interest. I just got back from Syria. So um, just wanted to vent a little there. Sure, sure, sure. Turning and also having having not raised one finger uh, against uh, uh, the Assad regime other than sanctions, which yeah. was the easy way to react, that, but not taking any foreign policy initiative there. Precisely. So Diego, while we're on the subject of Syrians, um, you know, there are lots of them in Turkey and they're a big election issue. Um, how much is that? Uh, coming into play during the campaign? Are, are, are the candidates constantly talking about how they're going to send out these people? And, and what's the public mood generally towards the Syrians? I mean, there, there's growing violence, one senses from reading uh, reports. Um, what, what, what have you observed and have you spoken to them, the Syrians, during your travels across Turkey? Yeah, so... It's less of an issue than expected. Uh, the Syrian refugee issue and the, their impact on economic dynamics in Turkey has long been a problem that Turkish citizens uh, cite as the many blame Syrians for rises in rents or uh, low pay, low pay, low salary for jobs. Um, but this election, it's been less of an issue than I would have expected. Uh, Khalid Staralu did address the topic, uh, saying that it was uh, not, not because we don't like Syrians, but we just can't uh, have them here indefinitely. Uh, the reality is obviously going to be different. Both governments will have a large Syrian population to deal with, and they can't just send them back to Assad, where their safety is not guaranteed. Uh, it's a controversial issue, but uh, you know, integration and other topics will have to be reviewed in the future. For now, it seems to be okay. People I talk to uh, say this topic might raise tensions after elections, um, but I haven't personally talked to Syrian refugees in the last month. Uh, but generally, it's the same as before, not feeling very welcome, not feeling, not feeling very safe, you know, can't have Arabic language signs on your store. There was that Somali restaurant in Ankara that was told to take down its storefront sign because of different colors or languages. So there's not exactly like, a, you know, what do you call it, cosmopolitan welcoming environment for multiculturalism in a lot of places. So Syrians live within that. Uh, it's a tough topic really because many Turkish voters who I talk to at some point in the conversation will mention Syrians as the source of their problems. And every conversation, if you talk long enough, Syrians come up. Uh, the problem is Syrians do low income work. They're picking vegetables. Uh, for less than minimum wage, I'm pretty sure they're an essential part of the Turkish economy. If you're complaining about the price of onions now, imagine what it would be if you had to pay the people picking them more. You know, Syrians are doing the job for less than minimum wage. Prices would go up there. You know, uh, managers on the fields use them, abuse them. They're, you know, nobody's proud about it, but they're an essential part of this economy. Without Syrians, you don't have that cheap labor. And you know, the next refugee group, Afghans, are not big enough to replace them. So who's going to do the work? Uh, I mean, I'm speaking bluntly. I hope it's not offensive. This is what I see. Not at all. Not at all. Well, I have a final question for all the panelists, and I hope the audience feels that we've addressed at least some of their questions. And um, I'll, the, my question to each and every one of you is to tell me, 
uh, whether you think the elections uh, will end in uh, you know the first round, and if so, who you think will win, and if there's a second round, who you think will win. Uh, and the same question applies for the parliament, who will have uh, the majority, the opposition or Erdogan's uh, alliance in the parliamentary elections. And um, we won't remind you if you get it wrong. <laughs> um, Genel, Hadi, tell us. I think the most likely scenario is um, is an opposition win in the second round. And I'm not saying that it's impossible in the first round. I think Kılıçdaroğlu still stands a good chance um, to win in the first round. But the more likely one is a is an opposition win in the second round. And if I may, I've seen two, two very important questions from the audience, and I think it's important to address them, which is, why are you even talking about elections? I mean, this is an autocracy. They're not even free. And here is my answer. I, I understand, as someone who's been really concerned and worked on election security in Turkey, that's a very important question. But this is what I think. I think... Um, Elections, as I said, are very popular in Turkey and fraud is not. And we've seen that in 2019, right? When Erdogan called for a rerun, he lost even by a big, bigger margin. And, and there are really limits to what autocrats can do in terms of outright engaging in uh, outright uh, rigging. Obviously, not autocracies are created equal. Rigging elections is easier in some, um, harder in, in others. And Turkey is the second case, I think. It's, it's not that easy. Instead, Erdogan has been doing things more sophisticated in the run up to the elections but on the day of the election it's not it's not that easy so and the second thing is obviously where will bureaucracy stands imagine a scenario where erdogan loses by a narrow margin and he doesn't accept the results so what the, i think the outcome is going to be determined by where turkish bureaucracy stands and i don't think it's it's not a foregone conclusion that bureaucracy will heed Erdogan's calls to um, not to accept the results. And the second question, very briefly, can Erdogan be tried? Can he be sent to jail? And I think that's not easy. Uh, two reasons for that. One, you need a 400, the approval from 400 MPs, and that's out of 600. And what makes it even more difficult is the fact that there are so many people who have closely worked with Erdogan in the past who are now in the opposition ranks. So opening all books is not going to be easy for, for the new government. Tim. Um, I, the most difficult election I've covered in Turkey. And um, if the opposition are going to win, it's probably in the first round. Uh, if it goes to the second round, very, very difficult. Uh, almost whatever happens in the parliamentary election, Erdogan will use it in his favour, right? I mean, if... If the opposition are the biggest party and dependent on HDP, you'll say, you know, obviously, vote vote for me, or, or, or you you know, the Turkey will be governed by the Kurds. And then if he ends up, you know, with uh, a majority in Parliament, he'll say, well, why would you want cohabitation? Vote for me as well. So um, he'll pull everything out. You know, it, it's 50-50, too hard to call. My gut kind of tells me Erdogan because he always wins, uh, frankly, and he, you know, you pull everything out. It's one of those elections, actually, it's funny that I feel that whatever the results, right, either a landslide opposition win or Erdogan just winning kind of 51-49, I'll sit, I'll, 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 the day after I'll say, that was obvious, right? Why was I so stupid not to see that, right? And I just find it, it's a very, very difficult election to call and it's 50-50, but my gut just tells me Erdogan, right? But, and I think these elections are really important, right? They're, they're so important that you know, I guess the opposition proves that they can win. Otherwise, I guess the country is going to a very different model of democracy. Aleyev was at the Technofest a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I mean, it's almost, it would evolve towards a Central Asian kind of democracy, right? Uh, anyway, there you go. Democracy, not quite a democracy, you mean an autocracy. So, uh, Mark, your turn. I'm Brian, I'm going to disappoint you. I'm going to give you a good Yabanji uh, answer. Who am I to predict anything? Uh, I've written already uh, several times that uh, for the first time in 20 years, uh, an opposition win is plausible, but uh, it's not uh, entirely probable. Um, what I think uh, is interesting as seen from here is that whether the day after the first or second round of the 
presidential election, we wake up with an EU compatible uh, president uh, of Turkey, um, because that's where we are. Uh, it is quite striking here, maybe people don't realize that in, in Turkey, that uh, at least before the campaign, uh, the Turkish foreign ministry, the president himself, the ambassador here, would repeat every day or every week that uh, accession to the EU is uh, the utmost priority of the Turkish foreign policy. Well, th this is uh, completely fake, of course, because by construction, by virtue of the new constitution, the 2017 constitution, Turkey is entirely incompatible with what the EU is. So uh, if at least we can, whoever is the president, get out of this ambiguity, uh, of his, his haze, uh, that would be uh, progress. Um, just one quick follow up, but very quickly, because we're running out of time here. We're in fact running over time. Uh, the audience uh, wants to know if you see any possibility of either a resolution of the Cyprus problem under either government, or could we even have a war if Erdogan stays in power with, say, Greece over the Aegean? But very briefly. Well, uh, simply, if uh, the incumbent president wins, uh, we're going to add to a two-state solution, and will, this will aggravate uh, the situation, period. Uh, uh, hopefully, with the opposition, we can resume the discussion. And Diego, another question from the audience, plus your prediction. Um, if Erdogan loses, is he going to accept that result, or are we going to see violence and um wh where would the you know gunnel says some of the bureaucracy might you know uh, align with him uh what do you think will the army for example side with him if he loses and just decides well i'm not going away um i know it's very speculative and you know just answer as much as yeah. you, know, you feel comfortable. just just to set this the, the record uh -huh. i said some some of the bureaucracy might not align with him might oh, not sorry i i i misheard okay yeah. gonna... that's okay okay sorry 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 um and and your prediction please diego no. i guess yeah. as a journalist diplomatic. You don't really want to, to be diplomatic but... anything can happen absolutely anything can happen and that's what i'm preparing for absolutely oh, anything in general you mean anything you know what we saw yesterday multiply that you know if you organize some crowds if police don't do anything while that crowd is organizing anything can happen uh, whether it's likely is another question it's very speculative uh, so i don't really have any data or evidence to say one thing will happen or not uh, but it's clear that if the margin is small, it's more likely that we see disruptions and maybe some uh, voting ir irregularities or some violence at ballot boxes. So that's as far as I want to speculate on that. Uh, because it's so close, my prediction would be Erdogan in the second round, uh, because he owns and manages all state resources. Uh, and there's many reasons for this. And just to list a few, uh, many voters uh, that my colleagues have interviewed at uh, Turkey Recap, in including Ingrid uh, Vodve, uh, link their benefits directly to Erdogan. So they feel like they're going to lose something financially if Erdogan is not there for them. They believe Erdogan is, is the state. The, the, that's the link they're making. There's businesses that rely on Erdogan, the, a lot of the economic structures and construction companies rely on him to stay in power. So they'll, you know, push their employees and, uh, you know, they have incentives to keep him there. And then the other thing which we haven't highlighted is the earthquake zone, right? Uh, how's voting gonna play out there? There's, you know, shockingly it's three months and we don't have a organized system for getting voters to ballot boxes. Uh, that's a complete failure uh, on the opposition, I would say because you have to mobilize, you have to get people to the ballot boxes. And the fact they haven't, or at least publicly said something about it uh, in a, a mass organization of uh, buses or something like that, maybe there's no resources. 
Uh, the fact that there's no big mobilization to get voters to ballot boxes in the earthquake zone is a detrimental to the opposition. So Erdogan, second round. Well, so I guess two for Erdogan, one for the opposition. Mark is sort of hedging his bets. And um, I, I honestly don't know, but I just think it's so hard to judge this one, to be honest, not just because the polls um, say it's so tight, but also I think it's very hard for anybody to get real information in Turkey today, even when you are in Turkey, given the climate of fear that exists, the confusion in people's minds. Um, well, thank you all so very much for joining us here today. I know how very busy and how much you're all in demand. Um, really, thank you. Çok teşekkür ederim. And thank you to all of you who joined us here today, of course. And sorry if I couldn't get all of your questions answered. <laughs>